a live hey, green now in the corner. Hey, how are you today? This is Josh Patrick, and you're at the Sustainable Business Podcast. Although you're watching us on Facebook Live, this really is a podcast, or it will be in a few weeks when we actually make it the one. So I'm Josh Patrick. I'm the founder here at Ask Josh Patrick, and our guest today is Phil Singleton, and he is going to talk with us about, oh, a whole variety of things, but he is an SEO expert. Don't worry, we're not going to really talk about SEO too much today. What we're going to really talk about is how he ended up working with John Janch, who is a well-known management consultant, author, kind of star in the world of business consulting. And he and John got together and did a book. Now, he happens to live in Kansas City. John lives in Kansas City. So my guess is there's some stuff there that's the same. So here's what's going to happen. I'm going to start the podcast recording. We're going to go for 22 or 23 minutes. Uh, after we're done, if there's any questions and you want to answer, we'll be happy to do that. We do not take questions while the podcast is running, but after it's over, we're happy to do what we want. So here we go. So, Phil, I'm going to start the podcast. I'll do the intro. We'll bring you in, and we'll get started. So here we are. Hey, how are you today? This is Josh Patrick, and you're at The Sustainable Business. And today our guest is Phil Singleton. Phil is an SEO expert. He's an award-winning author. And six, since 2005, Phil has owned and operated a digital marketing agency in Kansas City, Missouri. He also happens to be a co-author with John Janch of Duct Tape Marketing Fan, and they co-wrote SEO for Growth, The Ultimate Guide for Marketers, Web Designers, and Entrepreneurs. And we're going to start the conversation today talking with Phil about how he ended up working with John. So let's bring Phil in. We'll start the conversation. Hey, Phil, how are you today? How you doing, Josh? Thanks for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks so much for being on and being flexible about what we're talking about. <laughs> Most people have a uh, say, well, i got to talk about this. And if I talk about anything else, I'll have a problem. So, right, 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 right. You seem to be pretty flexible on what we're going to end up talking about today. Well, so, yeah, good. That's great. A lot of times, also, you mentioned you know, half people, their eyes will roll anyway. So it's nice to kind of go off and talk about things that are um, not always right in that SEM space all the time. So, yeah. It seems to me that um, most people think of SEO as kind of like the evil dark arts of the internet marketing world. <laughs> no I think that's kind of how it's had its um, history and its start. Thankfully, it's it's um, it's a lot more than that now, and it's about more things um, that you can do for your company that aren't necessarily kind of under the hood or in a back room, back office, or offshore type of the thing. But uh, but yeah, that's a whole other story altogether. Cool. So let's start the conversation by talking about your relationship with John Janch. Um, you know, this guy is like a, a major marketing star, best-selling author, uh, keynote speaker from all over the place. I think I've seen him speak like four or five times now. And uh, you ended up co-writing a book with him. How'd that end up happening? Yes, exactly. Like a relative nobody working kind of for my own boutique agency here in Kansas City. And you'd mentioned we actually both are located in Kansas City, but that's not how uh, we originally met each other. What How it happened was um, I have a number of you know small business clients here in Kansas City. And over the last, I don't know, it was probably three or four years ago, I had a, a client mention to me Duct Tape Marketing, the book Duct Tape Marketing. Um, and then I think a few months or a year later, some, something like that, somebody else mentioned it to me again. Um, and I think I heard it again. I might have heard it, you know, three or four, maybe even five times. And at th that point, I was like, "Well, geez, some of these potential clients that I'm talking to are reading this book. I'm going to actually have to, you know, read this book and read it." So <laughs> I went and I bought it, tore through it in a weekend, and I was absolutely blown away. Mostly because, you know, my approach to search engine optimization, not to cover that too much, is really mostly about trying to figure out how people search and then reverse engineering SEO around that. Well, what I found in his book and his whole approach to marketing, and I think a lot of people are in this now that are in this digital space, is about finding the ideal customer and then re reverse engineering marketing around that ideal customer. So um, I, I read that and I was like, geez, I'm already kind of doing this for my own uh, for my own SEO with those SEO blinders, if I just got open it up to marketing, I could probably offer a lot more to my clients. So I read it. I was fascinated by the book, tore through it in probably like a day. Um, but it, while I was reading it, I noticed he'd actually mentioned like a couple camp companies in Kansas City, right? 
Um, and then he actually mentioned one of my clients in there as an example. So I like read the back oh, of the book. Cool. And I was like, holy cow, this guy's in Kansas City. So at that point, I was already like, oh, this is really cool. I ended up um, reading more about him, as consuming some of his content. And he kind of pulled me in with his own, he guy practices what he preaches, right, with his own inbound strategy. Uh, and I kind of became, you know, a follower. And I read up about his um, duct tape marketing certification program. And really, again, not to get too much into SEO, but what has happened in the world of SEO is it used to be, you know, about backlinks and tweaking things under the hood of the website. And it's really evolved into this kind of multifaceted strategy where you're talking about content now and um, reputation management, social media, and all these things that actually look and sound a lot more like marketing. Right. So in order to be good at SEO now, um, I have to really open up and be better at marketing in general. I think that's what my initial pull into duct tape was, was to become just a better, better general marketer and not so much of an SEO tactician, um, because that's the way Google's kind of evolved. So I went in there and actually said, you know what, I'm actually going to join his certification program. So the cool thing about that is um, when you become certified through an influencer like John, you know, a lot of these guys are out there and they, everybody's kind of got their own course and their own kind of passive or distant kind of a learning program where you're learning through them. And I think John has some of those, too. But the interesting thing about, you know, joining some of these groups like like the duct tape is that I actually got to spend a lot of time with them and, and with um, with the meetings and the annual events that they have. That enabled me to actually build a personal relationship in person, which made a big, big difference. Right. And I took that opportunity to go in there and say, I'm going to try and impress this guy and give him, if he gives me the opportunity, um, try and showcase some of my skills in terms of guest blogging on his website or maybe trying to contribute or offer some of the work that I do to show him what I did. And over time, I think the more I did with him and worked with him, he became familiar with my skill set and I kind of built some of that trust. Um, and then eventually last year, I ended up pitching him on a book idea. And by that time, the relationship was already there. Um, and he, he loved the idea and the concept of it. And I took what I had kind of already built and showed him. And then he took and kind of worked with me to make it better. And we launched a book. So, so let me that was one of my end goals. Sure. Yeah. Phil, let me stop you for a second, because I want to go back and go to some of these steps you went through to build authority with John, because okay. I've done this several times with lots of influencers over the years. And I've noticed there's steps you have to take, which are pretty specific if you want to actually do this. So let's go under the hood a little bit there. And what was the first thing you did with John? The first thing I did is I actually reached out to him in an email and said, Hey, I recognize we're here. Um, I've got a couple ideas. Um, would, would it be possible to sit down and maybe have a cup of coffee? And what was his response to that? He said, yes, yeah, sure. See, now that's, that, that's unusual in the fact that um, you know, I wrote for the New York Times for a long time, and I wrote it. I won't tell you, bore you with that story, but it was a year and a half to get there. And my first email was completely ignored. So, uh, <laughs> so I got lucky on that one. I did, yeah, I so, lucky. so John is the type of guy, from what I understand, that he's pretty open to having conversations with people. Yes, he is. So you didn't do any research to find out if he would be open or not to that, did you? No, I think at that time I was just so um, excited about the opportunity and happy that he was in town here that I just basically took action and tried to say, hey, you know, I've got some really cool ideas for you. Would you would you have a few minutes for it? And it was interesting because I, for whatever reason, he said yes. And we had um, agreed to basically have a short cup of, you know, basically a cop, a cup of coffee. Um, but I think we got lucky in terms of the coffee shop not – for some reason, we ended up back at his office, which was a walk away. And that enabled me to sit down with him in his office in a conference room. And I got rolling and started to kind of pitch some of ideas. And I could see immediately he saw that there was something there. So the fact that we weren't able to have like a short, quick, quick cup of coffee, I think, and maybe a place where your attention span isn't really big. Um, you know, I got a break in terms of being able to sit there in, in a 10 minute coffee meeting, which is really kind of what it was set up to be, ended up being like an hour or more. And I think at that point, he probably felt like that I would be a good fit for some type of cooperation that, you know, down the road. So that, I think that made an impression on him. It wasn't like, though, at that, he's like, OK, let's write a book together at that time. That was actually three years, three years right. later. We'll, we'll go down that road a bit lower. But here's something which I think you brought up, which is really important for people to understand when you're working with influencers is that or actually with anybody for that matter 
uh, at one period of time, I was selling life insurance with a large national life insurance company. And they used to train us saying, well, just ask for 10 minutes of time of a business owner. And I used to always say to the trainer, said, that's crazy. Every time I talk to a business owner, it's at least an hour, if not two hours. And what I learned was because I had lots of valuable information, these guys want to learn. That 10 minutes always became an hour, if not two hours. I'm going to bet the same was true with you with John. Yes. And but I think you have to get point past that point where you're like, right, you're like, I, I went there prepared to bring my best ideas to dazzle this guy because I figured this was going to be my one chance to do that. Um, right. But you just never, I guess, never know if you're going to make that impression or not. You're going to have the opportunity to to, to discuss some more because if you would have had another meeting maybe a half hour later, I might have not gotten to that point where you know would it would have um, um, taken the next step. So if he had not been, if he had another meeting a half an hour later, did you have a strategy in place that would have hopefully gotten you another meeting with him? I don't think I did, but I think there's enough um, ambition and tenacity in me that I take action. So I, I would never at that point um, be a chance to meet him, not like follow up on it and either make it, give myself another opportunity to get a chance or have the door shut type of a thing. Um, but that's just kind of become my personality. It wasn't, I wasn't always like that, but that's kind of how I've, I've become, you know, when I've, have I gotten older and gained more confidence and, and thicker skin, basically. <laughs> well, if you, you know, one of the things I find is if I wet the appetite and we do run out of time, I will often schedule another meeting before we leave each other in the last minute or so. And I have found over the years that works incredibly well for me. So, okay, you had this first meeting with John. And you wrote the book three years later. What happened between that first meeting and three years? Um, we worked on step a, by step, if we can. Sure, we worked on a project together um, that I think, in that case, I didn't. I wasn't a, actually able to deliver on how I thought it would because the pro project became a little more um, complex. I do think that um, he saw that, that there was a lot of work ethic, and I put a lot of um, time and effort into it. Um, but really, I think my next opportunity with that was I wanted. I took the next step to say, hey there's enough here where I, I asked him, Hey, can I, is it possible for me to join your network? I want to be certified. Cause at that point I was thinking, you know, digital marketing and especially SEO is going a different direction. I want a certification that's going to make me more trustworthy and, and show that I have more skills. So um, I actually took the next step there and be, basically became his client, right? Because when you become duct tape certified, you're basically kind of, you know, paid, paying to get in, being certified, going in there, joining, I'm a network and almost kind of in a mastermind type of situation where you're, you know, sharing and meeting with other certified consultants and that kind of stuff. So, um, but I looked at it, my, I think part of my end goal was always to be like, I, I want to become an influencer, right? And the fastest way to become an influencer, in my opinion, is to leverage the influence that other people have built, right? So how do you do that? You got to find a way in to impress the people that have already kind of paved a road in front of you. Um, and I thought John's the best way that I can do this. So I got to find ways to get in with him and show him and cons consistently bring him value in a way that I'll, that I'll be able to leverage his, the platform that he's already built. So that was, I think, one of the goals that I had, I had initially even joining the network and kind of putting a skin in the game in terms of becoming certified. So, Phil, let me ask you, um, how many people do, did John have in his certification class with you? Um. The, the class that I actually went on, there was, I think, four or five people in it. So, But he has them every month or so. But what had happened is I think he had an initial version of this program that had 30 or 40 people in it. And then he actually kind of closed it down and then reconfigured it. Um, and then so I was actually on a, kind of on a waiting list for a little while. I was like, when this thing opens up again, let me in, let me in. Um, and then he opened it back up. And over the last two or three years, I think there's 120 or so um, certified consultants in it. So. Um, so, I know he's so, I, I hear something else which I think is really important, and I would really like folks to pay some attention to this because I, I think it's important. Um, there are several levels of influencers. It's easy to become involved with an influencer who is not named Tony Robbins, meaning that Tony Robbins, Brendan Bruchard, Russell Brunson, these are all guys who have over a thousand people at their, at their programs. So getting FaceTime and impressing them is 
slim to none to almost impossible. Whereas people like Chris Brogan, who is obviously a superstar in the space, John Jantz, Michael Port, those types of folks have smaller programs. Yes. It's much, yes. much easier to become an influencer with those influencers because you can actually grab them by the shoulder and say, let's go have a conversation and have a sidebar. Exactly. And if you're good at what you do, they're going to recognize it and they're going to want to be involved with you at some level. Exactly. And you mentioned, I know Michael Port and I know John have those kind of programs where you have the opportunity to be shoulder to shoulder. I don't know if Chris Brogren, I think all of them at that level should do that because they all do, then you they got all guys do. like they me, they're going to have some standouts that'll come out and try and show them their A game. Real, to me, the true, the true, um, I mean, if I were an influencer at that level, my main goal would be to show that I'm an, uh, is to create other influencers. That's the mark. I think of uh, one mark of, of an influencer is to try and have mentors and bring other people up. And I think John is doing that with some of the other folks in there. Um, I don't know if he necessarily is like consciously doing it, but um, he's certainly um, um, doing it with the, with the stuff that he's done. I think other guys out there should be doing the same. Yeah, thing. Yeah, the, the, the good ones. Do Chris Brogan is always recognizing people who he 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 likes. He's recognized me a few times over the years. He's been extraordinarily helpful. Michael Port. I actually um, trade some services with because I spoke. So does Chris have a program? Programs. Does Excuse Chris me? have like a, a certification pro Chris Brogan? I, no, no, no. Um, but he does, he does do live events. Okay. So as a result, and he's also, if you see him at another event, he is incredibly approachable. Um, the good news about when you're at their events is they're there for eight, nine, 10, 12 hours. So it's pr relatively easy to get 15 minutes of their time. Hmm. And with Michael, I ended up, spending probably is over a course of about a year i would talk to michael on a regular basis and he did some stuff that was just not correct in the financial planning world and i said michael this is going to cause you a problem here's what you need to do instead and as it turns out i was right and his other advisors were wrong so it got me an incredible amount of legitimacy with him so i i don't know nice. if you did this purposefully or was by mistake but what you've done is you said, I'm going to become an influencer by helping other influencers become better at what they do. Love it. Yeah. Because that's essentially what you did with John. I mean, you took your expertise and you brought it over to John's expertise and you combined it with John. And John said, gee, this guy can add some value to me and my tribe. And you had an opportunity to do exactly. so. And you were smart enough to ask. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. So when you think about that, that's kind of a cool thing. So exactly. uh, am I bet is, I mean, the thing I really like about what you, you described to me is SEO people, in my experience, tend to be pretty insular mm -hmm. and they haven't looked past, you know, like one of my favorite things today, there's an author named Clayton Christensen, who's a, a Harvard business school guy. And he wrote The Innovator's Dilemma. And he has two questions that I love which is what is the job to be done and why are people hiring you? And what you did was you really asked yourself the question, what is the job to be done? Even though you never really did ask that, but your answer from what I heard is I'm a marketing consultant. I'm not an SEO consultant. I'm a marketing consultant who uses SEO. I'm not an SEO consultant who knows something about marketing. Does that make sense to you? Yes. I mean, I'm, I love the way you're going to break in this and boiling it down, but that's exactly it. Yeah, I mean, it's really, you know, for me, this is really like, a, you know, a, a really fascinating thing because I think that this is uh, all of us who own businesses. There are people who can help us grow our business who are influencers in the space we operate in. Or even in the space that's right next door. You know, John Chance is not an SEO guy, but he is a marketing guy. He's a pretty good marketing guy at that. And SEO is part of marketing. It's a subset. Right. It's a tactic of how to be successful in marketing. So you took his stuff, you added it to your stuff, and you came up with something that's a whole lot better. Yes. So from my point of view, I think that is just a, a really cool thing. I appreciate that. I mean, it worked out. It couldn't work to have worked out any better. Um and um, it continues to kind of pay dividends. So 
it's 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 a great way to do it. So you wrote the book with John, and what did the book do for you? Wow, um, it continues to do quite a bit of things, but um, it one it established us as authority. I think it's helping to further establish myself as an influencer. Now, an influencer is, is um, you know, you got a micro influence, wherever I, my, my influence is growing, my tribe is growing, and my credibility, I think, in the niche is growing. So that helped out quite a bit. Um, but the, the purpose of the book at the end actually really wasn't only to do, um, to do that. What we really wanted to do is use the book as a foundation to build a high authority website that then we could also use to have um, course programs and certifications off of. Now, on top of that, what we tried to do is actually use that website in a way where we could create child websites, right, in other places around the country. For instance, we've got one in St. Louis called St. Louis SEO for Growth, and it's stlouis.seoforgrowth.com. So that when you do a search for St. Louis SEO, that child site comes up number one in that city for the service. So we're basically have John and I have kind of taken the little bit of the duct tape and kind of the SEO system I've developed, put it into a book. And we've used that book as a way to certify and train people, but also as a brand that we can help other marketers have these child sites that become lead funnels for them, for people that are searching for SEO services by city by city. So we've done one in St. Louis, we've done one in Atlanta, and we've done one in, I think, about 13 other cities and, and one in, in Canada right now. So you get you do these projects like a book, and it's, they're, they're never one-dimensional anymore, right? It's got a bunch of different things that it's done for us. It's established, I think, credibility for me. It's enabled me to leverage, again, John's influence because I took my, my skill set and my knowledge and was able to package it under his brand and reach a bigger audience. Um, and he also made it better by contributing to the book, of course. Um, but then we had a book that became a bestseller that became uh, an, a, the website that's become an authority and also been a great platform for us to then, you know, train and license and help people um, build these little local lead generation pat platforms. Um, so in so you've Australia. become one of those five year overnight successes. Uh, I don't, it's, we're working on it. But for right now, it's like right in the middle. It's working as we had hoped it would work. Um, but the story kind of is still unfolding. So, and, and the truth is, as long as you own your business, the story will continue to unfold. I'm having the time of my life. I mean, it's just really, um, you know, I came from the insurance industry out of school and I had one of these, uh, I had one of these jobs where, um, I was in a cubicle in a beige building, in a, you know, beige cubicle basically. And it was just this whole crushing job with the, the, eight hours seemed like, you know, 80 hours. Um, and, it, but it's since rolled into kind of this small business dream for me where I wake up at five every day, you know, you know, excited to do stuff. So, you know, I'm not making it in the sugar coat it too much. There are parts of the job that I, that aren't as glamorous as others. I don't like, but I, I you know, it's not like waking up um, for the job that I had in corporate America before. Not that there's nothing wrong with that, um, where I didn't have that enthusiasm, you know, to start the day type of a thing. So, and this, this recent stuff that we've been doing with John and duct tape marketing has made it even sweeter. So. Oh, cool. Well, I, I, um, one of my things is I don't really quite understand why people stay in bone sucking jobs because there are too many options in this country. Uh, all you gotta do is take it, figure out what you want to do, then find a way to get there. And the finding the way to get there is not all that difficult. We actually talk a lot in our wealth management world about, how do people manage their number one asset, which is their ability to earn money, which is often their jobs. So, Phil, unfortunately, for the podcast part of this thing, we're out of time. And you're an interesting guy, and I'm going to bet some of our listeners are going to find you. So if they wanted to do that, how would they go about it? Um my favorite place to connect with people is on LinkedIn. Um, love for people to check out seoforgrowth.com. Cool. Uh, that's where the book is. And um, of course, if you wanted to see a model of how um, we built our business, if you check out kcwebdesigner.com or kcseopro.com, um, those are two things that I've used to build an agency. Again, I'm an outsider. I didn't have, I don't have any classical training in, in graphic design or web development. I came in 
learned from the outside in a little bit later in life and, and still have made a, you know, a nice boutique agency here that, that continues to grow. And those are two nice little websites to check out to see how, uh, how somebody like me was able to kind of break in and become a, um, basically a leader in our local market here. So, Oh, cool. That's so much fun. Um, Phil, thanks so much for your time today. And I also have an offer for you. I have a one hour free audio CD course. It's called Success to Sustainability, the five things you need to do to create a personally and economically sustainable business. To get it, it's really easy. Take out your smartphone, and if you're driving, do me a favor, wait till you stop driving, but take out your smartphone and text the word sustainable to 44222. That's the word sustainable to 44222. You'll get a link, fill out the form, and we mail you the free audio CD. And by the way, if you happen to be in a position where you don't have an audio CD player anymore, and I just found out recently that a lot of cars don't have them, just send me an email when you get it, and I'll send you the audio file. So this is Josh Patrick. You're at The Sustainable Business. Thanks a lot for stopping by today, and I hope to see you back here really soon. And Chris, we're done with the podcast, but we're going to continue with Facebook Live. By the way, Chris is my audio editor, so. You didn't forget my name. I know. <laughs> I got you. Yeah, I didn't forget your name. I got your name is Phil. Hey, somebody Phil. pop up. Say, I said my name is Phil. Yeah, you have said your name is Phil. That's pretty good. <laughs> okay. I can tell because I have a pop up in front of you. It tells me your name. Oh, nice. Which is really good for somebody like me because I actually have a terrible name memory. It's like this mm -hmm. giant mental block I have. Bad, bad mm -hmm. thing, by the way. So, Phil, um, let's pivot for a second because I think that you know, your story is really interesting and your approach to the SEO is very different. So if you're going to be in the world of SEO and you want to get found and not pay a zillion dollars, what are the two or three things that you recommend people do today? Well, I'll give you the number one thing for sure is I think people should immediately and almost always focus on uh, reviews because it does, really doesn't matter what business you're in. If you can get people to review you, your business, um, and even you personally and put them up in the right platforms, those are, are becoming, the, it's becoming the content that is helping people to convert the most sales. Cause that's the way we all search for everything. Now you go to Amazon, you're looking for reviews, you're looking for authentic reviews. You go do local searches for any kind of service or product. Um, or home services, you're, you're doing a Google search and you're checking out the guy's reviews. Um, the thing with reviews are, is that they're, they're actually really rare. So you see a company that's got a plumbing company that's got maybe 200 reviews or whatever, they probably have had 2,000 clients or 20,000 clients, but they've only got you know 200 reviews on them. But when we see 200 reviews, we think that's a lot. So the, my main point is there is that they're relatively rare in terms of the number of transactions that you do. Of course, if you do bad reviews, then they're pretty easy to get because the system's kind of geared to collect negative reviews. But in terms of getting positive ones, they're actually really difficult to get. So you have to be proactive about this. You have to, I think, actually change the way you do business with people and constantly look at the next person that you're talking to um, or the next business owner as somebody that is going to review you online and, and use that as a goal and then have some kind of a system in place where you can make it easy for them and you, you can follow up with them. Because normally to get a, a good review online anywhere, you have to follow up with people two, three, four times. You get a lot of people that will say yes and never do it. But when you're able to kind of marry those at local SEO or SEO results with with the customer um, reviews and the social proof, that's kind of become the holy grail of Internet marketing, Right. Yeah. People find it for, for a brand. They've done some outbound marketing. They search online and all of a sudden they see all, all this proof where people have said, because when anybody is searching for anything these days, they're looking for they're looking for the choice. Right. They're not looking for a choice. They're trying to say, I, I need to find whatever it is I need, an SEO person or a plumber. Just make the choice easy for me and so I can make it a choice. And, and reviews do that for people. So. And then the other thing that happens is, especially if you're doing it for a local business, if you work on your review strategy, it really can help your, especially local organic rate rankings come up because those reviews give you a much better chance to show up in the map results, which are coveted, um, especially for, um, for, you know, again, for local businesses. Now, 
I think everybody should be getting them. So again, we're kind of focused on local stuff and we're in Kansas City, uh, but there's all sorts of other places that you can get when you get these reviews to republish them on your website, ask people that do them to republish them on LinkedIn or other platforms, you know, that might be more niche specific, but pound for pound, I don't think anything helps you out more than working on and consistently working on a review strategy right now. And that goes for SEO, I think, but it also goes just for your own kind of conversion of the, the traffic and the marketing that you're doing on your own, on your own business. So that would be number one. Okay, so let me ask you a question that's kind of a sideline here. Uh, one of my businesses is a wealth management business. And I think you may be aware that in the financial yeah. services world, reviews are not allowed because they're called testimonials. So if you can't do reviews, what would you recommend? I still think you're looking for some ways to, um, especially if you're going to use your, your website as a platform to... Um, provide some type of social proof. And I know uh, for financial services, because we work for some of them around this problem where they really seems like their hands are tied a lot of times with Facebook or the type of things they can do, and especially soliciting um, reviews and testimonials to put them on those, on those places. But um, I, I guess let's just say worst case scenario, you're, you're not allowed to get any reviews. Right. right. Yep. Um, then I would still, the next thing I would be working on is other things that are going to help you establish yourself as an authority in your niche, right? Yes. So then we're talking about blog posts. We're talking about writing eBooks. We're talking about getting published on podcasts. We're talking about getting, if you can, working on eBooks that can be published as Kindles and maybe <clears throat> having reviews on that content. That you can do, by the way. So... That's an, maybe another clever way to be able to get something where I'm not saying I'm not uh, I'm not um, getting a review on this financial service for my for my services, but I am can get one and maybe post some information on content educational content that I've published. Uh, you know, is that, that, would that be would that be would that be? I'm just curious. You think that if that would be pushing the envelope on that or not? Well, I I think it's fine as long as you don't move it to your website. So you can't you could wouldn't be able to have that. On your website, interesting. You know, I, I would. I'm not a compliance expert, so I would check with a compliance expert before saying yes. Um, I think some would say yes, most would say no. Um, now the SEC is reviewing this whole thing with testimonials right now, so that may change. But as we stand today, if you're in the wealth management business, you can't use testimonials, and depending on your compliance officer they're going to really set the tone what you can and what you can't do. There might be some compliance people who said, you can't even have reviews for a book you write, which I think is ridiculous because it's completely different. Um, I happen to have two businesses. One I can use testimonials on, one I can't. They can and they have to be completely separate. I can't bring the two together. So it's, it's a bit of a challenge. Not What's a horrible interesting. challenge. Yeah, so what's interesting in this space is I've dealt with a few financial services and some, it seems like the larger you are, the more concerned they've been with compliance. And I know one thorn in their side is some of the smaller financial services ones don't or seem to be rolling the dice a little bit. So they will actually put things that look like testimonials on their website, or maybe they will solicit reviews. But the ones that are right. really you know, in it for the long game, I think, are a little more concerned about, you know. Well, if you work for Morgan Stanley or Merrill Lynch or one of those companies, you basically can't do anything because their compliance department is actually a sales prevention department. <laughs> That's harsh. Here's an interesting <laughs> thing for you, though, is that, you okay, you can't put them on your website, but and you, pro you can't solicit, I guess, to get reviews, but you can't stop people from giving you a review on, on Google. If you're if you're. If your business, your financial services business is listed on Google, there, there's really no way to prevent somebody from giving you a positive, positive. Yeah, there, there, there's, it, in that case, you, you're correct. And again, you just have to be careful with that because, you know, you don't want to throw your career out to get a review. Right. Would be my 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 recommendation. But I think that's a. Would you go and tell the people that put them up? Would you please take this positive review down if you had five of them on Google Plus? That's, that's interesting. Um, it depends on your compliance department. They might make you do that. Wow. You know, it's, it's, it, this industry, there are, the, the standards are widely different from whoever is interpreting what it is they're interpreting. 
How about you as a person? If I'm a person, I'm on LinkedIn and somebody gives me a testimonial. Is that still is that a compliance? Yeah, that definitely is considered a testimonial. You can't. Hmm. In fact, you know those things how your authority for, you know, different topics are. You're not even allowed to have that on LinkedIn. Wow. Um, okay, so so that, we, had, we had to turn that off. So that was sort of the, the thing with that. So, so finance is a unique space. I mean, it's a big space in financial services and things like right. that. I mean, we don't, that's not a huge part of our book. But, but for most of the, the rest of the business community at large, I mean, this is, I think, one of the more important strategies to go after. And one, because you don't have to be an SEO guru to go up and ask and just simply ask your, the happy clients for a review. And the payback on it is huge. So you barely have to touch your website really for it. But most businesses, they just don't do it. They won't go out. They don't make it part of the routine. Um, but the ones that we work with and have done, if you get somebody, a local business or even a business from, from no reviews to 50 or 60 reviews, it usually changes their business and sometimes changes their lives. And again, I'm just, again, really more a little bit focused on on kind of the local and regional SEO. And yeah, no, I, think, I think that makes a lot of sense. Let me ask you a question about this. Um, it would seem to me that you would want to solicit reviews, but you need to have a couple of bad ones in there for legitimacy. I do think that, um, I don't know that you necessarily need them. I do think that a, a legitimate complaint and one that where you can see somebody has taken the high ground, I think, um, and I mean, the company can make the, the whole situation seem more, um, more realistic. Now, that being said, we what we do is we try and develop these systems like a review funnel where we've got a separate website we put up. That little website is only designed to collect reviews and it's got a star system. So if somebody clicks one big star on it, a form will come up and then that that um, review, that negative review comes back to the owner. Now, the idea of these review funnels isn't just to stack the deck with with good reviews. It is in some case to get better reviews for sure. But it also it really ends up becoming more of kind of a customer management tool, because if you can catch a bad review before it comes online and make that person happy, which is really what you want to do at the end of the day, then you've made you have basically made that customer's experience better because it's actually become part of your customer service management and not just a way to game the review system. But to your point, I mean, I think, yeah, I think at the end of the day, if somebody sees whatever level of reviews, a lot of people will zero in to see what happened in that bad situation. They want to see, did the company turn into a junkyard dog and, you know, try and blame the other person for being crazy? Or did they say, we did our best, we're sorry, we failed you, um, you know, contact us and we'll try and make it better type of a thing, which I think is what most people would like to see. Uh, but certainly, I think, yeah, those can those can add to the credibility of the website. But anymore, the way that some of these... Um, these 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 uh, platforms like Yelp and Google, it's it's getting harder to game them with fake reviews anyway. So the what really the ones that are putting up there, you know, there's nothing to. The, I, I guess what I'm saying, there's nothing to fear if you've got fifty um, if you've got fifty five star reviews. I think what really adds to the legitimacy more than the score is w how the people have written about their experience. If there's a um, genuine sentiment, yeah. if there's genuine sentiment in there, it's not like these guys did a great job. You know, that's not going to help you out as much as we hire these guys to build our pool. They were fantastic and very polite. The follow up was great. So like a genuine review that actually tells a story about what they've done, I think, is is probably um, more powerful than, than anything else. That makes that makes perfectly good sense. I just the reason I brought that up, there's a shoe company I buy shoes from, which I love. They have nothing but five. They have thousands of five star reviews. Nothing is, below is five. Is it their platform or is, are they on Amazon too? No, it's their platform. Right. So I think on the third party ones, it's really hard to have a perfect one. But if it's on your own platform, you, you, you sweep so to I, the side. When I was looking at the reviews before I bought my first pair of shoes, the fact that they didn't have anybody criticize their shoes made me wonder how legitimate the reviews actually I were. See. Point, point taken. So that was something you might want. We might want to think about. Hey, Phil, um, I really appreciate your time today. And um, if you're still watching this on Facebook Live, uh, Phil gave us contact information right after our, at the end of our podcast episode. He is obviously a guy who really knows his stuff. And if you want to, especially on the local stuff, boy, it sounds like you're just an expert at figuring out how to become a local star and. You know, the sustainable business is really about businesses that are blue collar, have 25 to 200 employees. 
it's where my passion is to be honest with you. It's probably what I'll be doing until the day I die is working for small businesses. Um, yeah, not to and, say you're, that bad. and you're, you're just really good for that stuff. So, um, I thank you so much for spending some time with me today, Phil. And those of you yeah. watching, thanks a lot for being here at the Sustainable Business. And we'll be back soon with another Facebook Live broadcast. Thanks so much. So, uh,